Thank you, and good evening, Southport Scientific, for what I think is the 21st time. So this is a short talk, you'll be glad to know, because of the <coughs> food and drink at the back. This is a talk that's going to take about 2,000 seconds or so to cover. And it's talking about what a second is, what can happen in one second, and the main point of the talk is the concept of leap seconds and why we need leap seconds. So I'm going to be looking at uh, time and motion, how we define time in terms of motion, the definition of a second, and just as a sort of a little aside, what can happen in one second to give us an idea of just how long one second is. I know you already know that, but just what can happen in one second. And I'll be talking about how we know that the Earth's rotation over a long period of time is slowing down. And we'll be asking why that is and what are the consequences of the Earth's rotation slowing down over a period of decades, centuries, millennia, etc. And then I'll say, what are leap seconds and why do we need them? So, just a reminder in terms of how we think of time, with humans, time is always the result of thinking about motion. We can't think of it any other way. In other words, we see something move, we can use that movement to judge the passage of time. That's essentially the only way we can judge the passage of time. And of course, for a long time, that's been done over millennia by astronomical means, by, for instance, looking at the passage of the sun, regardless of the fact that it's the Earth that moves, we see the sun apparently move in the sky, and then we can look at the shadow on the sundial to judge the time of day. Or, of course, we can look at the phases of the moon. The moon is going round the Earth in a month or thereabouts, and so we can use the changing phase of the moon to give us a longer time scale. But when you ask yourself, well, OK, we can use the sun or the moon to judge the passage of time, but what, given that we're talking about a second, we have to think about the definition of a second. And you might say, well, surely the definition of a second. Everybody knows, even a youngster knows the definition of a second. We know that one day is divided into 24 hours. We know that one hour is divided into 60 minutes, and we know that each minute is divided into 60 seconds. So we know that one second is that fraction, 1 over 24 times 60 times 60, or 1 over 86,400, that fraction of a day. That number of seconds in a day, 86,400, that number will keep cropping up in this talk. So, okay. so you could say that's all there is to a second. It's just that definition of a day. So it's simple. So you say, right, that's the end of the talk. On with the drink and the food on the back table there. Well, no, not quite, because we have to think a little bit about how the Earth moves. When it comes to the Earth going round the sun, it doesn't go round in a circle, it goes round in an ellipse. And because the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, rather exaggerated in this particular diagram, uh, but it gives the basic idea, you see how far the Earth moves in a month. When it's a long way from the Sun, it moves a relatively small arc, whereas when it's closer to the Sun, the Earth moves faster. So the Earth's speed varies as it goes around the Sun. Whereas the length of time it takes to rotate once on its axis is effectively independent of how it moves around the Sun. So if it moves quite slowly out here and quite quickly here, that means the passage of the sun across our sky isn't totally uniform. If we were to photograph where is the sun in the sky at a particular time of day, for instance, noon, let's just take an example. If you had your camera in a fixed position and you photographed where is the sun at noon, not surprisingly, you find it's higher in the sky during the summer and lower in the sky in winter in the northern hemisphere. But notice it doesn't simply go up and down. It actually moves east and west as well as north and south. You get this characteristic sort of figure of eight called an analemma. So the north-south variation is the easy one to figure out because you know that because of the tilt of the Earth, if you're tilted towards the sun, the sun appears higher in the sky. If the Earth's axis is tilted away from the sun, the sun will appear lower on the southern horizon. So that variation, in this case from the Northern Hemisphere, between June and December, is the easy one to work out. But it's not so obvious that actually the sun is not due south in the middle of the day. Sometimes it's a little bit further east, sometimes a little bit further west. And it's because of the fact that the Earth goes around the sun in an ellipse, and sometimes it goes slower, and sometimes it goes faster. So sometimes the sun hasn't quite made it to the 
meridian due south, and sometimes it's already past due south at the middle of the day. So the east-west variation, the fact that it's a figure of eight rather than simply a line that goes up and down if you photograph the sun every day, that east-west variation is a result of the Earth's orbit, not the Earth's rotation. And that's why sundials don't always read correctly. They can be off by as much as 15 minutes one way or the other because the shadow is based on where the sun is and the sun is not always in the same place every day because of this east-west variation and that's because of the Earth's orbit, not because the Earth is spinning at a different rate today compared to last week, but because of the Earth's orbit, not because of the intrinsic rotation of the Earth. So if we want to know how the Earth is actually turning, sundials are of no use whatsoever. A, they're not accurate enough, and B, they depend on the Earth's orbit. It's not simply a question of the Earth's spin. So if we want to know how long a day is, and for me a day is 24 hours, not from sunrise to sunset, not the hours of daylight, simply how long does it take the Earth to rotate once on its axis. If we want to measure that accurately, we need something much more accurate than a sundial. And that's what has happened for the last few decades. We've invented clocks that are accurate enough to very carefully monitor the rotation of the Earth. Since 1968, we've had a very particular definition of the second. That many, I won't read it out, but those nine billion or so oscillations of a particular atom, a cesium atom, have been the definition of how long a second is. Strictly speaking, it's it's sort of the oscillations of the atom, but actually what's measured is the radiation that is being emitted and absorbed by the atom. And it's a particular isotope called cesium-133. It's very easy to obtain very high purity. In other words, that isotope, very few other isotopes in cesium, they're generally unstable, and therefore it's easy to get a large number of atoms that are all identical. If you try that with a different type of atom, you might end up with different variations of that atom, different isotopes with different number of neutrons in the nucleus, which will, which will blur your ability to measure time accurately. So if you take a cesium atom, it will vibrate such that we define that many vibrations of a cesium atom is defined to be one second. And that's been the definition since 1968, the start of what is colloquially called atomic time. It's more correctly called the cesium standard. And the, there in the bottom right is a photograph of an early atomic clock. Right in the middle there somewhere is uh, cesium, and there's a, a microwave uh, waveguide there, which is sending microwaves backwards and forwards, being absorbed and emitted by the cesium atoms, and then they're being measured. And every 9 billion, 192 million, et cetera, oscillations, or wavelengths, if you like, of the microwaves that are being measured, that's defined as one tick of the atomic clock. Now, the precision that you can get with these atomic clocks, you can get basically better than one nanosecond per day. One nanosecond, one billionth of a second per day, per 86,000 seconds, is the sort of precision that you can get with a modern atomic clock. It's equivalent to saying if I started two clocks and kept track of if they're drifting, you wouldn't expect them to drift more than about one second in 30 million years. That gives you an idea of the accuracy of clocks today. They don't have to be large things anymore. Atomic clocks can be relatively small. For instance, NASA are developing a, a clock to go on space probes. It's not everything in front of these technicians. It's just that little box on the top. That's the atomic clock, no bigger than about a toaster. Small enough that you can, in principle, put it on just about any spacecraft. So if you want to send a spacecraft out into the solar system, if you want to navigate accurately, one way of doing it is to make a note of how much the spacecraft is accelerating, which you can do with the sort of accelerate accelerometers, pretty much the same sort as you've got in your mobile phone, just a little more complicated. But if you know how much you're accelerating and you know exactly what the time is, you can work out exactly where you are. And so having an accurate clock is a very useful way of navigating into the outer parts of the solar system. And even here on Earth, accurate time matters. It's not just a question of exploring the solar system where time matters. For instance, in the GPS system, we've got a whole load of satellites sitting um, quite a few thousand miles above the Earth's surface. And the idea of picking up the signals from various satellites and working out where you are on the Earth's surface 
That's based purely on timing. In other words, every GPS satellite has an atomic clock on board. Your GPS receiver, in other words, your phone, does not have to have the accurate time. It relies on the fact that every satellite knows exactly what the time is. And it works out how far you must be from each of these satellites, knowing that the speed of light is a known quantity. If I know the time when the signal left these satellites, I can work out where I must be on the surface of the Earth in order to give the timings that I get from these various satellites. Because, of course, it takes a fraction of a second for light to travel from the satellite to the surface of the Earth. But given that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, if the clock in a GPS satellite is wrong by, for instance, if it was wrong by one thousandth of a second, if the clock was wrong by a millisecond, light can travel 300 kilometers in a millisecond. So if the clocks had drifted by a millisecond, you wouldn't know your position on the surface of the Earth better than an accuracy of 300 kilometers. It wouldn't necessarily put you on the right continent, let alone the right side of the motorway. If the clock was wrong by a microsecond, you still have a problem. You would then be wrong by 300 meters. It would put you in the right city, but it wouldn't necessarily put you on the right road if you were using it to navigate. So you can see that you really do need nanosecond level accuracy in clocks if you want to pinpoint yourself on the surface of the Earth to an accuracy of, let's say, a meter or so. So accuracy definitely matters. And yes, the, the clocks that are in each of these satellites, they will drift. And so every once in a while, they are designed to be autonomous in the sense that they can work quite happily without communicating with the ground. But just to be on the safe side, every time they go over a particular set of base stations on the ground, the base station sends them a signal which resynchronizes their clocks. So in other words, all of the GPS clocks are resynchronized as often as possible, usually every few hours. In principle, they could be left for a few days, a few weeks, maybe a bit longer. But just to keep everything as accurate as possible, resynchronize the clocks as often as they go overhead, as seen from a particular base station on Earth. Let's just have a think about what can happen in one second, a blink of an eye, as it were. The fastest supercomputers that are around can do a lot of calculations per second. 200 billion? Well, no, I've left some noughts off. It shouldn't be 200 billion. Should it be 200 trillion? No, I've left some noughts off. It should be 200 quadrillion calculations per second can be done by the fastest computers. Well, at least this was the fastest computer a few years back. I haven't checked, but probably the two needs to go up to a three or a four or a five these days. Even though computers can do that many calculations in a second, bear in mind that if you want to do a very complex calculation, such as how does a protein fold in your body, or how did the universe evolve from the Big Bang to now, if you wanted to do a simulation of the evolution of the universe, it might take the program, the program might have to run for days, or weeks, or months, even though the computer is doing that many calculations per second. It gives you an idea of just how complex some computer programs are these days. So don't take it for granted when you see a simulation of a galaxy or a universe evolving. Remember the amount of computing time it took to generate those simulations. We know that light travels at a fixed speed, 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers in one second. That's obviously quite fast compared to, for instance, the fastest object that we've ever thrown out from the Earth, which is now heading on its way. The Voyagers are now heading off towards the nearest stars. Um, the Voyagers are traveling at something like 16 kilometers a second. That's really fast for a man-made object, but of course absolutely trivial compared to the speed of light, which is why the nearest stars might be a few light years away, but it's not going to take a few years for Voyager to get there. It's going to take tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years for the Voyager spacecraft to make it to the nearest stars. Coming down to Earth and just asking ourselves, well, here on Earth, what can happen in one second? I just took some pre-COVID statistics. I thought I really ought to update them at some point, but I took some 2019 statistics for just what can happen in one second. It's not always 
easy to get accurate data, but I believe these are in the right ballpark. In one second of any given day, of any given month, of any given year, in one second, 300,000 texts are sent between individuals across the world. There are some 60,000 searches done by Google. Other search engines are available depending on your preference. Some 75,000 videos are streamed every second. I think at least half of them involve cats, but, um, and I'm sure that number is now much higher. 700,000 messages sent via things like WhatsApp and other apps uh, on your phone other than text messages. 700,000 per second. And a staggering 3 million emails are sent every second. I tried to get an update post-COVID as to how much these have changed, so I found it difficult to make direct comparisons, partly because, for instance, social media has taken off to the point where in terms of videos streamed, it's not just things like YouTube that tend to send out lots of videos, but there's also other platforms which tend to distribute short videos. So the number of videos per second has gone up in the last few years and is more like 3 million now rather than 75,000. The number of emails has gone up a little bit to 4 million. Number of texts, I think, is the same, which is interesting. In other words, people have moved on to other ways to communicate, and the number of texts flying around are about the same. But I find it staggering that there were 4 million emails sent every second. It's a shame to think just how many of them might be spam rather than genuine <laughs> information being sent from one person to another. But it's just a reminder that in the global economy, just how much people rely on communicating with each other. But the atomic clocks that were sort of built in the 60s and have been running ever since are telling us that the Earth is slowing down, that the rotation of the Earth has been changing since 1968. So the definition was made in 1956. It was defined that the Earth made one revolution relative to the Sun in exactly 24 hours. In other words, in exactly 86,400 seconds. That's why that particular number was chosen. Remember the 9 billion oscillations of cesium? That particular number was chosen because that married up with the fact that the Earth turns once in 24 hours. In other words, once in 86,400 seconds. But although it was exactly 24 hours by definition, it was only a couple of decades later that it was found that the Earth's rotation period was 86,400 and a bit. It had already slowed down only a couple of decades after the original definition of the second. It was three milliseconds longer, uh, about 20 years after the definition was made. Why is the Earth slowing down? Well, it goes back to the Thayer, input, uh, Thayer impact. This is a hypothesis which is widely believed by a number of people that the early Earth, some 4.5 billion years ago, the early prototype Earth, was hit by a Mars-sized object. It might have been a glancing blow, it might have been a head-on collision. There were lots of things in the early solar system, lots of big rocks, lots of planets trying to form. Maybe a half-formed planet crashed into what was ultimately going to be called the Earth, and it splayed off a huge amount of debris. That debris eventually coalesced into the Moon. So the Earth was impacted. Who knows how fast the Earth was rotating before that point? We have no real idea. But we believe that if that's when the Moon formed, then the Earth was rotating at about once every five hours at this point. And the Moon was a lot closer to the Earth than it is now. Over billions of years, the Moon slowly moved away from the Earth, and the Earth spin slowed down. So very fast rotation in the very early days, five-hour rotation. It's now a 24-hour rotation. In the far, 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 far future, it'll get slower and slower and slower. Why is the Earth slowing down? Well, it's because the Moon, this I hope you realize is not to scale, so we've got the Moon over here raising tides on the Earth, and you th might think that the tidal bulge will be pointing towards the Moon. But the Earth is rotating, and of course the Earth is rotating with a period much less than one month, so the Moon is going around the Earth quite slowly compared to the speed at which the Earth is rotating. 
So although the moon generates a tidal bulge in the Earth's oceans, and to a lesser extent in the rocks as well, but if we think about the oceans, it raises tides in the ocean, and the rapid rotation of the Earth pulls that such that there's an offset. It's not, the bulge is not pointing towards the moon, the bulge is a few degrees ahead of the moon because of the rotation of the Earth. That means the moon is pulling on this and effectively applying the brakes just because the moon has got a gravity which is pulling on this, which is closer than this on the other side, so it's going to be, generally speaking, slowing down the Earth. And, in a sense, the Earth is speeding up the moon. So there's an exchange of angular momentum. The total amount of angular momentum in the system must remain constant, but there's an exchange between these two bodies because they are gravitationally bound to each other. So the moon is slowing the Earth, and the Earth is speeding up the moon, and the moon is gradually moving away from us. We are fairly sure that's the case because the distance to the moon has been measured essentially every day for the past 50 or so years. Since the Apollo astronauts put reflectors on the surface of the moon, lasers have bounced off those reflectors so that we can judge the distance to the moon to an accuracy of a few centimeters or so, and that distance has been measured every day for 50 years. And we know that the moon is gradually moving away from the Earth. And we think that's the consequence of the fact that it's slowing down the Earth's rotation. So what? So the moon is slowing the Earth. Who cares, basically? A day is no longer an exact number of seconds. It used to be, but it isn't anymore. It hasn't been since the 1960s. A day is not an exact number of seconds. But this is just analogous. It's just the same sort of problem as the fact that a year is not an exact number of days. We've lived with that for quite a while. We know that there aren't 365 days in a year. There's 365 and a bit. And we know that has caused problems in the past because the Julian calendar had to be rejigged into the Gregorian calendar to take into account the fact that the whole number of days doesn't make a year. So one year, as near as this accuracy will do for the time being, a year is roughly 365.2422 days. For our purposes, that's accurate enough. There's more decimal places if you want them. So, of course, 365 is not close enough. If you take the year as 365, you will get an error every year. You'll get a quarter of a day, and that will build up over centuries, and that's why there was this discrepancy between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. If it, wouldn't, if it wasn't addressed, then the calendar would drift relative to the seasons. In other words, you would have a calendar that tells you it's this particular month, but instead of July being a warm month, it would be cold outside if you let the calendar drift relative to the seasons. So it was considered a good idea to put in a leap day every fourth year, make every fourth year a leap year and add a leap day. That would give you a year of 365.25 days because you're adding a quarter day effectively every year. But of course, it's still not quite right. 365.25 is still slightly off. So how do you close that gap? Well, the actual rule we have at the moment is you add a leap day every leap year, but you skip a leap day in a century year that's not divisible by 400. So if you get to a century year, like the year 2000, you check if the year 2000 is divisible by 400, and then you decide whether you're going to put a leap day in or not. That, when you work it out, gives you a year length of 365.2425. Notice it is very close to the actual year. So by adopting this particular way of doing it, you end up with a year which is very close to the true year, and that means your calendar is kept in sync with the seasons for many, many, many thousands of years. Pretty close. What if you wanted to do the same with the fact that the Earth is slowing down? If you want your 24-hour clocks to stay synchronized with the rotation of the Earth, much like you want your calendar to stay synchronized with the seasons, you would need not to add a leap day every few years, you would need to add a leap second every once in a while. You would have to add another second to your clocks. Well, strictly speaking, you don't need to add leap seconds. You could find alternatives. You could basically say, well, let's keep the clock synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. If the, ro if the Earth is slowing down, let's just make seconds longer. Let's just allow time to be redefined. 
But of course, the scientists would be absolutely furious at that because it would mean you'd have to redefine what you mean by a second continuously because seconds would be continuously getting slowly and slowly longer and longer. Atomic clocks would have to be programmed to run slower and slower and slower to stay in sync with the rotation of the Earth. And that would be, of course, totally impractical. So although we don't need leap seconds, the alternative is just too difficult to comprehend. This is the actual length of a day. It's the length of the day after subtracting uh, 86,400 seconds. It's the number of milliseconds, notice, not seconds. It's the number of milliseconds left over once you've subtracted 86,400. And notice it's, got, it's going up and down, and it's got a whole load of what looks like noise. Strictly speaking, it's not noise. If you look at how that's going up and down and up and down, and you think about the individual years here, because we're going from the 60s up to almost the present day, notice it's going up and down and up and down exactly every year. There's an annual variation to the way the Earth is rotating. And we've got a pretty good idea of what's doing that, it's the atmosphere. You'd think that surely the air can't have that much of an influence on the rest of the planet because the rest of the planet is water and rock and other stuff and air is surely very low density. Well, true, but it does change significantly through the year because when we've got the uh, northern summer when north hemisphere is pointing towards the sun and northern winter when the northern hemisphere is pointing away from the sun you have a different amount of sunlight reaching the northern and the southern hemispheres and it's not totally symmetric simply because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere and much more water in the southern hemisphere and that changes the way the ocean of uh, the oceans and the atmosphere circulate so the pattern of atmospheric circulation is rather different between northern winter and northern summer, which is why you get this variation. If the air circulation is different, the angular momentum is different, so the rotation of the Earth changes speed. So we understand that sort of annual vibration, uh, annual variation. But of course the elephant in the room is, what on Earth is causing that? Why was the Earth slowing down for quite a few decades until the 1970s? Then it appeared to speed up again. And then it appeared to slow down, then it appeared to speed up, then it appeared to slow down. Something is making the Earth go faster and slower on time scales of order decades. And this is still an active area of research because I'm not sure anybody really understands what's going on. It's unlikely to be small scale things. Some of this small variation that I'm not highlighting here is due to, for instance, earthquakes. If you get an earthquake, the Earth's crust rearranges itself. The ocean floor might lift by quite a few meters. It'll then push some water around and produce some tsunamis, but the water will find its own level again. But if the ocean floor rises or drops, that means you have a different size, if you like, of crust. It's a different distance from the, the bed of the sea to the center of the Earth. So when you think about the way things rotate, just like if a skater pulls their arms in, they rotate faster, you're changing the so-called moment of inertia of the skater, which results in a faster angular speed. And that will happen with the Earth. Depending on whether the ocean bed was raised or lowered, it can change the moment of inertia of the Earth, which changes the speed of rotation. But that would only produce relatively small changes. Some of these are definitely correlated with earthquakes and shifts in the crust. Possibly shifts in glaciers as well, but again, a very small effect. Some people seem to think that this sort of variation over decades, if it's not in the atmosphere and it's not in the crust, we don't think it's anything to do with the core of the Earth. You could monitor that with magnetic fields, for instance. It is thought that that might be due to changes in the Earth's mantle. Don't know exactly why, but maybe there's some circulation within the Earth's mantle, which is again changing where the most dense rocks are, and that would produce a change in the speed of rotation of the Earth. So it's an interesting area of research to try and understand what's going on. I haven't highlighted it, but it looks like the last little bit of that curve is actually going down. So that means the Earth at the moment looks like it's speeding up rather than slowing down. So if we did want to put leap seconds in, 
where do we actually add leap seconds? Leap days, we know, we've got a standard way of doing that. Everybody in the world agrees, sorry, everybody using the Gregorian calendar agrees that if we're going to add a leap day, we'll do it according to the formula I just showed every fourth year, taking into account centuries, etc. And we'll add it by adding one day to this month. The February month that usually contains 28 days, we'll add an extra day and call it February the 29th. But what do we do about leap seconds? It's not so obvious what we do about those. That has to be decided by somebody, somewhere, who decides whether or not we're going to put a leap second into the day. It's decided by the International Earth Rotation Service. I worry about what happens if these guys go on strike. Uh, <laughs> does that mean the rotation of the Earth grinds to a halt until we get them paid the money they deserve? They decide how often a leap second should be added by looking at the curve we've just sort of looked at. But remember, we can't predict what the Earth is going to do next. So unlike leap days, where we know exactly what's going to happen and we know exactly when they need to be added to the calendar, we can't tell when leap seconds are going to be needed to keep the clocks synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. So these guys decide on whether or not we need to add a leap second, and they decide on basically when and where it's done. So leap seconds have been added in the past. The, the black line here is, is indicated on the left by the length of the day in milliseconds. Now I'm looking at some red dots, which are going to be scaled according to these uh, labels on the side there. Leap seconds were first introduced in the 1970s. And at that point, remember, the Earth was spinning three seconds longer than normal. It was rather slow, so we needed to add quite a lot of leap seconds. So leap seconds were added at a prodigious rate in the 70s and 80s. But notice how the black line is now coming closer down to 24 hours, which is why we don't have quite so many. Notice that in the sort of early noughties or so, somewhere around 2005, the rotation of the Earth, for some reason or another, came back close to 24 hours. And if the rotation of the Earth is close to 24 hours, we don't need any leap seconds. So they were not put into the clocks for quite a few years. And then the Earth started slowing down again, and so leap seconds were added. But we haven't had a leap second since 2016, the end of 2016, the start of 2017. Because apparently, we don't need any. But it's worrying some people to say, well, it looks like the Earth is speeding up. If the Earth speeds up a lot, this curve could actually go to the other side of zero. It could go to below 24 hours. That means we'd have to take a leap second out of the clocks rather than add a leap second in. And that's worrying a few people because it's never been done before. If you're going to put a leap second in, what do you normally do? You decide at midnight, instead of five pips at midnight, you're going to have six pips at midnight. So you're all familiar with what clocks look like as you go through midnight. You get 59, and then you get 59.59, and it resets to zero at midnight. The next day starts. But if you're going to add a leap second, what do you do? If you add a leap second, what you actually do is watch the clock. After 59.59, 59.60, and then you reset to zero. So it is a perfectly valid time to have a time which is 23 hours, 56, <laughs> 59 minutes, 60 seconds. In other words, if you ask how many seconds there are in a minute, the answer is usually 60. But every once in a while, there are 61 seconds in a minute whenever you add a leap second. Computers have to understand this. Computers have to be programmed to make sure they understand what the time is. If it's important to you that you know how many seconds was it between this event and that event, you have to absolutely know what clock you're using and whether or not there was a leap second inserted into the clock in between time event one and time event two. If timing is critical, you have to make sure that you account for leap seconds correctly. If you are going to put them in at midnight, whose midnight are you going to put them in? If, you put, if Japan puts them in at their midnight, they'll put them in quite a few hours before India, who'll put them in a few hours before Europe, who'll put them in a few hours before the USA. So if everybody puts a leap second in at their own midnight, that means everybody's clocks are going to be slightly off, 
perhaps only by half a second or so, throughout that day. Remember what can happen in one second. An awful lot can happen in one second. If you're sending money across the world, if you've got an international set of banks and you're trying to make sure that this $10 billion is going from bank A to bank B and they timestamp them, you have to be absolutely sure that the two clocks on the two ends of the transaction are synchronized. Otherwise, there's a no man's land in the middle where nobody owns that $10 billion because it's gone from there and it hasn't arrived there yet. And some enterprising criminal could probably go in and nick it during that one second when nobody seems to own it. It is absolutely critical you get timestamps correct when you've got global economies and global finance. So having things desynchronized by one second could, in principle, be very, very important. So the bottom line is some people really don't like the idea of leap seconds. We don't know when they're coming. We can only decide by watching the rotation of the Earth whether or not we need a leap second coming up, and if so, when do we put it into the clocks. Some computer systems really do not like leap seconds. It is possible to crash some operating systems because of the 235960, which is a perfectly legal time, but if entered into some operating systems, the computer simply does not like it. And some companies, some businesses, really do not like the idea that their clocks have to be reset every once in a while, perhaps a couple of times a year, perhaps every year, perhaps every few years. The idea that you have to do this every once in a while, some companies really do not like. For instance, Google do not like that. So rather than say we're going to have a clock that runs as normal, and then at the end of the day we're just going to arbitrarily shoehorn another one second into our clocks, they say, we're not going to do it that way. What we're going to do, instead of having 61 seconds at the end of the day, we're going to deliberately run our clocks low, slow, such that we add the extra leap second a few microseconds at a time. In a sense, you add the leap second not at the end of the day. You drip feed the leap second throughout the day. And you do that by running your clocks ever so slightly slow, such that by the end of the day, they're in synchronization with everybody else's clocks. But that means Google clocks are off compared to the rest of the world's clocks for that particular day. So again, you have a problem. You could say, well, OK, smearing out the second by putting it in throughout the day rather than putting it in at the end of the day, you could say, well, if everybody did that, it wouldn't be a problem. But if some people do it and some people don't, well, then you have a problem. And the joke goes, well, what if you took that idea of adding a leap second by stretching it out for the entire day rather than inserting it at the end? What if you did that for leap years? What if you did that for February the 29th? You'd then end up with a situation like this cartoon. Why do the clocks say it's 3 o'clock in the morning? Well, because adding the February the 29th produces too many glitches. So we've just decided to run our clocks 3% slow for the entire month of February. That way, we don't have to add the day at the end. We just run the clock slow, and February 29th does not have to be inserted at the end. But this idea of leap day smearing compared to leap second smearing, leap day smearing is just a joke. So leap second smearing does take place. And it's a problem. Leap day second, uh, leap day smearing just reminds us how crazy it would be to actually try that for leap days rather than leap seconds. So what are we going to do about leap seconds? The International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, is an international agency set up by the UN that was given the task, figure out what we're going to do about this mess. We've got this mess where we have to decide, are we going to change our time signals, yes or no? How are we going to do this? Are we going to continue with this idea of adding leap seconds if and when they are needed? And by the way, it looks like the Earth is speeding up again, so it might be that we have to take a leap second out of the clocks, which has never been done. Are we sure that every computing system in the world will be happy by taking a leap second out of their clocks? It's a little, by, little bit like the Y2K bug. In principle, it shouldn't be a problem. 
are you absolutely sure that every system is going to be happy by taking a second out of their clocks? So they were charged with, make a decision about what's happening with leap seconds. And in 2015, they made a monumental decision. They decided not to decide anything until, <laughs> until 2023. So they said, let's put the problem off. Because they could see what the curve of the Earth was doing, and they could see that the slowdown had reversed and it started speeding up again. So they sort of said, let's wait and see what happens to the Earth, and then we can make a decision. But 2023 is now upon us, and there aren't that many days left in 2023. So, a decision of sorts has been made. It was published in Nature a little while ago under the title, The World Votes to Stop Pausing Clocks. So, one plan is that we will never again have leap seconds after 2035. We'll continue with the current way of doing things for the next few years. For the next decade and a bit, we'll continue with the idea of adding or possibly taking out leap seconds to keep clocks synchronized with the Earth. But after 2035, we'll stop. A lot of countries are happy with this, except Russia, who want it to be 2040. Ah. OK. But nobody has decided how long we'll keep that. If we decide to stop putting leap seconds after into the clocks after 2035, for how long should we just leave that? For how long should we let the clocks drift relative to the rotation of the Earth? Do we do it for a century and then come back and visit the problem again? Do we do it until all of these leap seconds have added up to a leap minute and then decide to put a leap minute into the clocks? Do we wait until there's an hour and everybody notices that the sun is rising at the wrong time and then we put an hour back into everybody's clocks? Well. There's no decision. The idea of getting rid of leap seconds has been widely acknowledged as possibly a good thing, but how to deal with it in terms of, well, when are we going to revisit the problem? Are we simply going to stop it and then leave the problem to our great-grandchildren, or are we going to have a policy of we will stop the leap seconds until they've added up to a leap minute, for instance? The bottom line is the world thinks this is a good idea, but it's the ITU that actually makes the decision, the UN agency that decides whether or not the clocks need to be changed. And it's possible that the ITU might veto this idea of no more leap seconds after 2035. So the story of leap seconds has not been decided. So basically, the only thing I can say is, well, for the next few decades, keep an eye on the time. Thank you very much for listening.